Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Our text for this day comes to us from the Gospel of St. Matthew in the 13th chapter, especially the first two parables spoken today. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Sometimes you need a little encouragement. Sometimes you need to be built up. Sometimes you need a little comfort. Well, the disciples needed that comfort and encouragement. Things were starting to change, and not for the better. For a while, Jesus' popularity had grown and grown. He did miracles. He thought, taught with authority. He healed people, he cast out demons, and the crowds were getting bigger and bigger. But then Jesus' teaching began to get more challenging. He was calling for deep commitment and a change in people's worship. The religious leaders were turning against him. Jesus challenged the way they did church and the ways that the leaders had used their positions for power and money. We can imagine the kind of reaction they had to his preaching. Things were actually getting downright hostile. The crowds had gotten smaller and smaller and smaller still. Resistance to Jesus was becoming threatening. Can you imagine the reaction of the disciples? What's going on? This is not how it's supposed to be. The crowds are supposed to get bigger and bigger, right? If the Romans start to show their muscle, Jesus is just supposed to flick them away. Opposition is to be crushed. The Pharisees and priests who get in the way, well, they'll be replaced. So might have said the disciples. But none of that was happening. In fact, the disciples were starting to feel very, very vulnerable, even attacked. Some might have been wondering, did we really sign up for this? And discouraged, confused, afraid, they needed encouragement, comfort, reassurance. And do we ever feel that way? Do we ever feel that this world isn't how it's supposed to be? Do we ever feel that, that the church isn't the way it's supposed to be? In the Middle East, Christians are, are often second-class citizens with few rights or few protections especially in those regions where Islamic extremism has taken its foothold, churches are burned, pastors and priests are beaten, imprisoned, beheaded. That's frightening. Now, it's not that bad in the United States, but there has been a very tangible shift in the way things go on. In some college classes, professors openly attack the beliefs of the Christian church. And those professors who are Christian sometimes may not get a promotion or tenure or published in their peer articles because, because they believe what the church teaches about creation, about life. And the name of Jesus Christ, the name of God is being removed 
taken away from the public square. And that is discouraging. The sanctity of life as God created it has taken a beating as well. The abortion statistics speak for themselves. But we also see this disrespect in the end of life in states such as our own that have legalized medical assisted suicide. You see a disrespect for life amongst the youth in the very poor and urban areas where they feel they are without hope. And how preteen girls are taught how, how to dress, the certain body type they should have if they're going to be of any sort of value. Or in how rampant pornography on the internet has turned men and women alike into things to be objectified, things to be abused. That is disturbing. Perhaps even you're embarrassed by what's going on in the church itself. With words of scandal, embezzlement, the reports of sexual misconduct involving church leaders that we see ever so often in the news. It makes you drop your head. Or maybe it could be that churches have closed for lack of members. Or maybe it's the empty seats in the pew. The empty pews in the service. The crowds are getting smaller and smaller. Those who say they have no religious affiliation seem to be growing in this country, and that is hard to take. We can certainly empathize with those disciples. We might be confused, we might be discouraged, we might wonder what is going on. It's not supposed to be this way. We need a word of encouragement, a word of comfort. We need to be reassured. And so along comes Jesus Christ. He speaks to the disciples. He speaks to us. Two parables. Very, very short parables. A man finds a treasure in the field and he gives up everything to buy the field. A man finds a very precious pearl and he gives up everything to buy the that pearl. Now traditionally, the church has often seen that treasure to be Christ Jesus himself. And indeed he is. But if we look at these parables Christologically, who is it that is the treasure? And who is it that's the man? We ourselves certainly couldn't buy our way into God's presence. We just don't have, we don't have the currency, the currency of righteousness. And so that man must be Christ Jesus. And he indeed will give up everything. He will give up his place in glory. He will give up his power, his prestige to be born into this world, to take upon himself our human frame. He'll give up his popularity and the safety he enjoyed when he was saying things people liked to hear in order to complete his mission. He will give up his very life. He will give everything he has for the precious pearl, for the precious treasure. And do we know what that means? Disciples. Disciples are treasure in the eyes of our Lord. They are the pearl that he wants that he might give everything for it. And not just disciples. We too are treasures in Jesus' eyes. Every human being is a treasure in the eyes of Christ Jesus. That he would give all of himself empty himself on the cross. 
So Jesus gives these parables as encouragement. He reassures us that what's going on is not the way things truly are. He treats us with the special dignity that comes from being God's wonderful creation, knit together in our mother's wombs. Jesus treats every single person with the total sanctity of life, and he will sort things out in the end of days. Those who have persecuted the church will find out who is Lord of all. Those who have done evil in his name will learn that their works did not please him. And those who are faithful to the end will rejoice in his glory as he comes back to us. But until that day, we need encouragement. We need comfort. In fact, we need comfort food. When people are feeling down, when when life sort of kicks you in their teeth, what do we do to make ourselves feel better? For my wife, it's mac and cheese. For me, it's mashed potatoes and gravy. For others, it's, it's maybe a pint, maybe a quart of ice cream. Or hot buttered popcorn, or hot chocolate. For each of us, though, for each of us in the church, Jesus gives us the ultimate comfort food. When we go to the table of our Lord, we receive everything that he gave for us, his true body and his most precious blood, given and shed for you. We are welcomed to eat this comfort food and know that Jesus is truly present, truly present in our lives just as he was truly present with the disciples so long ago risen from the dead, alive, and working, working his wonderful gifts of life and salvation in us. Some people also like to take hot baths. Well, Jesus has comfort water as well. In the baptismal water, Jesus comes to us and says, You are mine. I gave everything. I paid it all so that you will always be precious in my sight. And in the baptismal liturgy, we welcome the newly baptized with these words. In holy baptism, God the Father has made you a member of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and an heir with us of all the treasures of heaven in the one holy Christian and apostolic church. Now that's comfort. Now that's encouragement. That we together as one body bear one another's burdens, lift one another up. And certainly our sister Ollie needs that comfort. There are times when each of us needs that word of encouragement something to reassure us despite what we see happening in the world, in the country, in the church, in our homes. Jesus still sees us as his pearls of great price. And so listen, listen then to the church speaking in the epistles, in the prophets, of the word of comfort that has come to us. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The first letter of Peter in his second chapter. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. The prophet Isaiah in the 43rd chapter. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, 
compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. The letter to the Colossians in the third chapter. Sometimes we need a word of encouragement. Sometimes we need that word of encouragement. That word that is Christ Jesus. The word made flesh. And today, today we've heard it. And may we always, hearing this word in our ears, take it within our hearts, speak it upon our lips, live it in the work of our hands, that we may know and we may proclaim that we are his treasured possession. And Christ has given everything that you might be his. And being his, we have forgiveness life, and salvation. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.